Well, South Africa faces major changes to its climate. Our average annual temperatures have increased by at least 1.5 times more than the observed global average of 0 0.65 degrees Celsius in the past 50 years. Added to this, extreme rail rainfall events have increased in frequency. Well, to talk to us about climate change and its impact on South Africa, we're joined by the Environmental, Forestry and Fisheries Minister, Barbara Creasy. Good evening, Minister, and thank you so much for your time. Firstly, just when you look at the weather patterns, the different weather patterns that South Africa has been experiencing over the last couple of years, so some of them quite extreme in nature, are we definitely seeing this as an impact of climate change or uh, how, how is the department viewing it? Well, I think, uh, Cathy, throughout the world, the science on climate change is irrefutable. And I think that the South African government accepts the science. Uh, we also accept that we are living with climate change as our daily reality. Only uh, a month ago, there were more than 20 people killed in Southern Africa as a result of Cyclone Eloise. And this cyclone passed through the Northern Cape, an area that normally receives 256 millimeters of rain in a year. And in five hours, the Northern Cape received that amount of rain. It's, it's absolutely unprecedented for a tropical cyclone to pass through the Northern Cape. And I think this is evidence of what we all understand, extreme weather events, storms, drought, and of course, as you said in the beginning, rising temperatures, all of these are symptomatic of climate change. How does all of this then inform policy, Minister? Because I, I would imagine that you can't do things in the way that you would before, mm -hmm. because you now have to take into account and even plan for what could well be the inevitable. Well, Cathy, South Africa is a signatory to the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And being a signatory to that agreement, there are three things that we have to do. We have to mitigate carbon gas emissions. We have to adapt to the reality that climate change is already with us. And we have to look at what that means for our settlements, our infrastructure, our agriculture, and our daily lives. And of course, we also have to put aside means of implementation so that we can introduce the changes that are necessary. You would know that last year, uh, COP26 was postponed as a result of the COVID pandemic. And this year, um, we are expecting that COP26 will take place in Glasgow. And this is the, the first year when the Paris Agreement is in full effect. And South Africa, along with all other signatories, has to submit revised, a revised nationally determined contribution to reducing greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. Um, this is, is obviously an important process which is currently underway. Uh, but you would also know, Cathy, that on Friday, we had what I think is one of the most significant meetings in recent times, the inaugural meeting of the Presidential Climate Change Commission. And really the task of that commission is to look at where we are now. We're a, a carbon intensive economy and society. We want to move towards a low carbon climate resilient economy and society by mid century. And uh, it's really the role of the Climate Commission to help us to work out how we move from where we are now to where we would want to go in the future. One of the things, of course, is that government has been saying this for a number of years now that they, you know, there's a commitment to lowering the country's carbon emissions and just really ensuring that there's greater care for the environment. But when we look at part of what these studies show us, so we not only have South Africa as being the continent's worst polluter, but we are also seeing an increase in carbon emissions and it's not decreasing in the way that one would have expected, or at least not in line with government's promises anyway. Uh, that's not true, Cathy. Um, uh, we are definitely below the um, peak plateau decline trajectory 
that was originally worked out and submitted to the UNFCCC. Uh, perhaps we are below uh, our carbon emissions targets for reasons that we don't have to be particularly proud of, namely the, the state of, of our economy and um, the state of energy generation in general. But um, we definitely have at least uh, 60 million tons uh, of carbon gas emissions as a what you can call a, a carbon budget. Um, as I say, I don't think that that's something that we are necessarily proud of. And I don't think that as a country, we would not believe that we, we, we can and must do better. And that is why this process of revising our nationally determined contribution to reducing greenhouse gases is something we will be doing this year. And it's a very important process. Of course, one of the issues that has been highlighted over the years is that there isn't a great deal of accountability, especially for those who are offenders in terms of the sectors that are contributing to, to this problem of, of, of high carbon emissions. Well, I think that's what we're setting up now, uh, Cathy, is what we call the mitigation system. So uh, the way in which the, the world uh, carbon system works is on the basis of carbon budgets which each country works out for itself. That is what we call the nationally determined contribution. If you want to reduce your carbon emissions, then obviously you have got to start to look at how you will change the budgets, the different spheres of industry, our power generators, our transport sector, and so on and so forth, contribute to the overall greenhouse gas emissions. Now, one of the things we discussed when we met in the Presidential Climate Commission on Friday is that if we are committed to a low carbon trajectory, we need to understand how we get there, uh, firstly, while maintaining energy security, and secondly, and perhaps most importantly of all, how do we get there in a way that preserves jobs, creates jobs, and understands what the jobs of the future are going to be. Across the world, as economies battle with the COVID-19 pandemic, many, many countries have developed recovery strategies. Our own country has a reconstruction and recovery strategy. And inherent in that as one of the sectors that we have to work on is the area of uh, the green economy. Now the green economy or uh, what we, we can, we can um, elucidate and say the, the development of alternative forms of energy generation, different ways of managing waste, different forms of transport, and indeed different forms of, of manufacturing. These are some of the key areas in, across the globe at the moment that are introducing new forms of technology and also creating new jobs. In our own space, we have over the last five years introduced 4,200 megawatts of renewable energy. And this process has created 50,000 jobs. It's brought in over 200 billion rands worth of investment. It's, it's brought in uh, 1.2 billion rands worth of uh, development in the local communities concerned. And it has also created new owners of these electricity supplies from those who would historically have been excluded from economic ownership. So I think that um, our own experience is that green industries have considerable ability to generate jobs. And this is something that the Climate Commission would want to be looking at as we move forward. In the interim, uh, Minister, what are the plans to, I suppose, ensure that our infrastructure at the very least is geared up for some of the changes that are happening in the climate while you get the policy to also uh, align with really where we are? Well, uh, ESCOM made a very interesting announcement last week. They announced that they are going to begin repurposing and repowering 
the first of their power stations. You know, there, there are eight power stations that are due for decommissioning by 2030. And um, they've announced that Kamati will, power station will be the first power station that, that will um, be repurposed. They're putting out a call for proposals. They're looking forward to people who would be interested in developing uh, renewables at that plant. Uh, they've got three more power stations, Croat Flay, Camden amongst them, uh, being others that, that in due course, they will probably put out calls for proposals. So I think that, that what you can see is that when we think about a transition from our current high carbon trajectory, one of the, the key and fundamental issues we have to think about is the question of justice. So it's not the fault of communities that live in Mpumalanga and are heavily dependent on ESCOM and its subsidiaries for their livelihood. Uh, they, they should not be the people who carry the burden of this transition. And I think that that part of what we said when we met as the Climate Commission on uh, Friday is that looking at projects that give us proof of concept that it is possible to, to transition from high uh, carbon pathways to lower carbon pathways, we've actually got to start to set up those projects and we've got to start to set up the proof of concept. Of course, when we're talking about adaptation, uh, it's also going to be very important that we start to look at government buildings and of course, even uh, private homes to look at how we make these buildings more energy efficient and more water efficient. One of the things that we know about climate change in our space is that it's going to make our country drier. And so we have to start to introduce technology and infrastructure that uses less water and less energy. That was Minister of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries, Barbara Creasy.